I am Tim Barber. I'm one of the co-founders of Canada 2020. I'd like to thank Roland and Taylor for inviting me to moderate this panel. Uh, I have been told I have 60 seconds to in, uh, introduce our, uh, our two speakers and moderator. Did you say 60 seconds? Just quickly, uh, Andrew Mandel Campbell, uh, Director of Corporate Communications at Kinross, and the author of the cheekily uh, titled a book, uh, Why Mexicans Don't Drink Molson, will be our second speaker. Our first speaker is Jennifer Kiesmet, uh, Chief Planner, City of Toronto, a job which I'm sure comes with danger pay uh, these days. Um, and I have the honor of uh, introducing Anne Golden, who I'm reminded, I just said to Anne a few minutes ago, I first met in 1991 or 92 when Joe Clark asked you to come help out with the constitutional file, another job which took Jane Gerpe. But um, so uh, we'll, uh, for people, for longer bi biographies, they're obviously provided to you, so please uh, have a peek at those. And I'm going to invite Andrea to get up and say a few words. Oh, sorry. Je I screwed it up. Jennifer. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here today. I do feel like a little bit of a fish out of water because I have my head very, very deep in urban issues. But as an exercise in embodying, connecting the dots and thinking in a profoundly interdisciplinary way, this has already been enlightening and inspiring for me. Uh, the city that I come from, uh, just to shift your perspective, because certain key names pop into mind when you think about the city of Toronto today. I'd like to let you know that the city of Toronto is in fact the fastest growing city in North America by a long shot. We have over 160 high-rise buildings under development in our city, including major revitalization projects. And we also uh, in our city, are um, we're experiencing a tremendous amount of what I would call third evolution of urbanization, meaning that the majority of our growth is happening in our most urban places, and we are attracting a very young generation to live in the core, and that generation overwhelmingly is choosing to walk to work, to move in a very different way from how we've planned in the past. I will link back to this idea several times in my presentation. We are, in fact, embodying some of those key ideas that are so critical to creating a livable city. I have, in fact, called I called this presentation, or this chapter, towards an international strategy for livable cities. More than half of the global population lives in cities, and this number continues to climb by over 60 million people a year, according to the World Health Organization. It may seem that as we embrace an urban world, moving from rural agricultural societies to city, that the places where we live, work, and play will inevitably, naturally, become beacons of prosperity, innovation, sustainability, livability. Cities, after all, represent progress. The urbanization of our world is a sign of our evolution as a species. And we do know that there are some examples in our world where our cities mostly work. Places where the mix of uses, amount of density, and variety of natural and public spaces combined with high quality design and infrastructure to create a very livable city. These cities are resilient in economic downturns. Their walkable, transit-oriented communities are built at densities that facilitate local economic development, entrepreneurialism, and meaningful work. These cities value access to education and cultural institutions as much as they value access to clean land, air, and water. These cities are places where it is possible to arrive as a newcomer and comfortably transition within one generation into the middle class. Why can this happen? This happens because all of the amenities that you need, such as libraries, access to recreation, affordable housing, great transit, are at your fingertips. And we've heard today about the risk of unemployment to geopolitical stability, the integration of immigrants into stable, meaningful work mitigates this concern. These cities, these cities that work, are not only points of pride for their nations, they drive foreign investment. They drive the gross domestic project, and therefore they drive shared national prosperity. 
These cities, however, on a global scale, are rare. The vast majority of cities in the world need to be fixed, not emulated. Many, most in fact, are characterized by high unemployment, environmental decline, and substandard housing. They are hindered by poor city design, resulting in long commutes, lost productivity, and limited access to the natural systems that sustain human life, such as food and water. Alarmingly, the world's poorest, most vulnerable, and least resilient cities are growing the fastest. Jakarta, Mumbai, Cario, Beijing, Shanghai, a city of 24 million people. These cities are growing the fastest and they are the most vulnerable due to inequality, poor infrastructure provision, and environmental degradation, as well as climate vulnerability. Lack of democratic processes also inhibit these cities that are growing fastest. This rapid pace of urbanization continues to strain the infrastructure of cities around the world. The provision of basic services, such as access to clean water, electricity, it poses threats to human health, of course, but it also stifles economic potential. In absolute terms, in the period of 1990 to 2010, that's about a generation, the number of people without improved access to water has actually increased in urban areas, despite our push to upgrade existing infrastructure. Access to electricity, although improving in the rapidly industri industrializing countries of Asia, also remains stubbornly low in many less developed countries. Nigeria, its capital, is experiencing explosive growth with a population of 5.5 million people. But in fact, only 50% of that population has access to a steady supply of power and it's continuing to decline. So in some places, our planet has cities that are the manifestations of our highest intelligence, our greatest capacity for innovation. But in others, we've developed bad habitats that compromise our shared future. Places that require redesign and investment in order to be resilient, sustainable, and importantly, just. These places are fragile, politically unstable, and incomplete. In these places, survival, as opposed to a high quality of life, is the goal. Despite the continuing economic growth of cities, over 85 million people in cities around the world, according to the World Bank, live in informal housing settlements. Without a doubt, how we approach our final global migration from rural agricultural societies to urban places on a global scale will define the future of our species and our planet. Now I'd like to shift gears a little bit, having discussed where we are on a global scale with respect to cities, and talk a little bit about the Canadian contribution, what we know here in Canada about livability. In the context of a global exploration of urban sustainability, prosperity, and livability, Canadian cities offer some unique insights. According to Grosvenor's research, now Grosvenor is an international land development firm based in the UK that develops properties all over the world, and they recently, in 2014, undertook a comprehensive assessment of 50 of the most impactful cities in the world. The three most resilient cities in their analysis that came to the fore were, in fact, Canadian, one, two, and three, respectively, Toronto, Vancouver, and Calgary. Canadian cities, they state, have a strong combination of low vulnerability and high adaptability. There is a high level of resource availability, of course, in Canadian cities, and Canadian cities are, despite what some of us in the room might think, well-governed and well-planned. Well, far from perfect and not without their challenges, Canadian cities consistently rank at the top of benchmarking studies looking at best practices related to livability, resilience, and economic growth. According to the Economic, 
Economic Intelligence Unit's 2013 Livability Report, Vancouver, Toronto and Calgary rank among the world's top five most livable cities. Toronto is considered the world's most youthful city by the 2014 Youthful Cities Ind Indicator. That may sound frivolous, like it doesn't matter. But the Youthful Cities Indicator is about future workforce. It is about future economic development. And in fact, Toronto ranked number one, New York number two, Berlin number three. In recognition of the oncoming global competition for talent, as boomers increasingly retire, I'm actually hoping some boomers will retire at some point, appealing to youth through desirable places with a high quality of life is critical to that future talented workforce. Toronto also leads globally in the Resilient Cities Index, followed by Vancouver and Calgary in second and third place, respectively. Resiliency, as an idea applied to cities, is defined as the capacity to adapt and absorb future impacts of both climate change and energy scarcity while maintaining a livable environment. These factors, combined with the relative ease of doing business, drives the success of Canadian cities in attracting jobs, talent, and foreign investment. According to the American Cities of the Future 2013-2014 report, Canadian cities of all sizes rank highly on indices comparing economic potential, human resources, business friendliness, and foreign direct investment. I'd like to now talk a little bit about the implication of this great wealth of livability and talent in the Canadian context. What does this mean? for our topic at hand, an international strategy for Canada. How do cities contribute? An international strategy for Canada in light of worldwide urbanization must position our prominence and growing expertise in city building as an export. An export that embodies our most cherished Canadian values and allows us to facilitate social justice on a global scale. As articulated in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, these values include the celebration of our diversity and multiculturalism, the protection and promotion of human rights and freedoms, respect for democracy, and opportunity for all. These values manifest in the way we live our daily lives in cities. The extent to which we live side by side in diverse communities, respecting and celebrating interculturalism is distinct to Canadian cities. The provision of basic infrastructure and services that provide opportunity and access to full participation in Canadian society is an outcome of the way we organize our cities and their services. And, important, and importantly, the civility with which we recognize our differences and negotiate our values through local democracy is entirely contingent on the access to participation that we provide in our cities. City building, it turns out, also presents itself as a platform to address climate change through progressive green policies that result in the remediation of brownfield sites, the improvement of air quality through green roof policies, and the reduction of our energy consumption through the implementation of green standards such as LEED. And as an aside, in the next four years in the City of Toronto, because of our explosive growth and our very strong policies around green roofs, we are going to have more green roofs than any other city in the world, the equivalent of 40 CFL football fields worth of green roofs in the city of Toronto. This is transforming our air quality. It's transforming our stormwater management. Cities, when we plan mixed-use communities, are a critical tool to lift people from poverty. One great example is the St. Lawrence neighborhood, built nearly 40 years ago. The redesign of Regent Park, another profound example and also Streets to Home, a program started in Toronto to address homelessness that in fact has been emulated around the world. Sustainable cities of the future will provide healthy places for diverse members of society to thrive. And we know, according to the Economic Intelligence Unit, that the quality of a city's physical infrastructure 
is highly correlated with its overall competitiveness on a global level. So what might the objectives of an international strategy for Canadian cities look like? If we consider the critical elements that determine the success of a city in providing a sustainable, livable, prosperous place for people to thrive, three objectives come to mind that are consistent and central to Canadian values that it is most imperative to export. The first is something we do so well, welcoming, respecting, and integrating newcomers. Fundamental to our final global migration is the need to successfully transition newcomers into cities in a way that capitalizes on their interests, assets, and potential contributions to the new society they are joining. Well-designed, transit-oriented communities are the backbone to accessing education, employment, and ensuring affordable movement options, providing access and opportunity for integration, essentially creating an inclusive city, mitigates the potential for crime and potential social unrest. Those informal settlements around the world that are grow growing so rapidly are the result of an inability to integrate new people into a city or a country. The second key objective of an international strategy needs to be attracting talent as the basis of a knowledge and innovation-based economy. In this last wave of global migration, cities will thrive to the extent that they are able to appeal to a diverse, agile, and entrepreneurial workforce. These new mobile global players are creating and bringing new ideas and energy to the countries that they adopt as their own. This group chooses livability over access, placing a greater emphasis than past generations on access to culture, meaning, and community life. In the city of Toronto, for example, not only is this demographic driving our condo boom, which is the biggest boom in North America and is in the top three of growth booms in the world, it is also driving our office sector boom, as companies like Google and Coke and TD Bank are returning to the core of the city and expanding their offices to be within walking distance of this emerging workforce. The third key, third key objective of this international strategy needs to be designing for long-term health and sustainability. It is no longer sufficient to pave over paradise and to hope for the best. Changing weather patterns demand new approaches to infrastructure investment and consideration of the food, energy, and water systems that are necessary to sustain the flourishing of life. If there is one issue of all the issues that an international strategy should recognize as being rooted in a global shared interest, it's climate change. And we change our impact at the level of how we plan and design our cities. So how do we do this? How do we export our international strategy on livability and cities? Well, to lead on a global scale with respect to city building, we need to refine our own urban agenda by identifying, making explicit, and recognizing in federal policy our national shared interest in great city building. And while, of course, a national transit strategy and an affordable housing plan are two good places to begin, it is imperative to acknowledge that cities drive our GDP, facilitate our direct foreign investment, and assimilate new immigrants. As such, an urban agenda or campaign at the federal level must be pervasive, seeking to reorient the ways in which we view, understand, plan, and fund our cities. To get there, we must get our house in order. The great success of our cities today is an outcome of visionary contributions. Think subways, parks, schools, affordable housing of past generations. Currently, our infrastructure deficit of Canadian cities stands at around $171 billion. In addition, we like, to, we like to tout the extent to which we have become an urban nation. But in fact, the research of Professor Dave Gordon from Queen's University demonstrates that we are a, a suburban nation, that in fact many of our forms are unsustainable, and we need to use our highest intelligent to adapt those forms. Again, we have work to do at home. 
But given the role our cities play in the global economy and their growing importance as cultural gateways, there is a considerable need for the federal government to provide stronger support for Canadian cities. Infusing all aspects of federal governance with an urban agenda as a fundamental lens through which to extrapolate Canadian values, both at home and abroad, would both ensure progressive city building and leverage our successes to gain international exposure and help Canada strengthen its presence globally. This urban agenda should focus on the core elements that support livability, housing, transit, the environment, long-term infrastructure, and incubating innovation. Innovation happens in our cities. Our cities will define our future as a nation and can position us to become leaders in urban excellence. Supporting cities is an international interest and a national imperative. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I should uh, let you know that um, my presentation has nothing at all to do with uh, cities. Um, the only thing I think we have in common is I live in Toronto and I'm thankful I didn't have to take the subway today. So. <laughs> Um, uh, I just want to say uh, thank you uh, first off to Taylor uh, for uh, uh to, for inviting me here today because, um, uh, you know, in the current job that I have, I, I don't, and in the jobs I've had over the last few years, I haven't had a lot of time to think past the, the current crisis, the, the quarter, or, you know, what's happening in, in question period tomorrow. So this is a, a great opportunity for me to think a little bit further out as, uh, as I once did as a journalist. And um, I should say before I begin that this is, in fact, I think the first public presentation I've done in, in a couple of years now. So, of course, all of these um, opinions that I will be voicing are mine and do not reflect those of my employer. Um, I was asked to write about uh, and present on international competitiveness and innovation. And of course, when we, when we hear these key words, we often think of, you know, immediately Silicon Valley comes to mind and, and this rush over uh, recent years to become, to recreate Silicon Valleys all over the place. Silicon Valley of the North, Silicon Valley of nanotechnology, of biotech, you have, whatever it might be. Um, and not to say that these aren't, you know, valuable initiatives, but I feel that, you know, too often uh, we have used a lot of our critical resources here in Canada, scarce resources, and, and scattered them in a way to try and recreate these kinds of Silicon Valleys, and I'm not really too sure how much value we've got in return. A great example, of course, would be here in Ontario with the Green Energy Act. Um, the fact of the matter, though, is that we already have a Silicon Valley in Canada. And that Silicon Valley is, in my opinion, the mining industry. And I realize that I work for a mining company, but I, what I would tell you, just to be clear, is I work for a mining company because I believe that it is the Silicon Valley of Canada. I chose to work in the industry for precisely that reason, because that's the kind of industry that I wanted to work in if I was going to work here in Canada, in the private sector. Now, I will say it's not a particularly innovative sector, but it does have most of the critical ingredients to be, to, to be a world leader, and, the fa and, and one of them is, we already are. So my belief, and I'm a pragmatic person, is you don't reinvent the, reinvent the wheel, you do what you're good at. And we're great miners. So the question is, do we want to continue to be global leaders? And I think that's the challenge that we face as a country right now. And I'm going to go through now just a kind of a list for those who might not be aware of, of some of the, the things that we have to offer and why we are a global reader, leader right now. We have obviously a very long and rich history in the mining sector. Much of the wealth of this country is built on the foundations of mining and we continue to have an incredibly rich resource here in this country. We are home to the largest cluster of junior miners anywhere in the world, 1,600 at last count, and we are um, a leading global center for mining finance. Uh, and uh, as you know, the TSX is home to 57% of the world's publicly traded mining companies. Um, we are home to some very big companies, Barrick, Tech, Potash. We are the number one company in the world in gold mining. We represent 30% of all mining companies with a capex of between 50 and $30 billion. 
30%. We're also home to some of the world's leading technical service suppliers, engineering companies like Hatch, Golder, SNC-Lavalin. This mining is one of the few industries in Canada where in fact we are global leaders and we have a global footprint, not just here at home in Canada. And we have very high quality graduates. Um, we have a human resources that is considered among the best in the world. We have a reputation as being very skilled miners and high standards in corporate responsibility. Um, we don't have a, a great sense of the true size of the, of, the, of the sector, but we do employ at least half a million people here in Canada, and um, there are varying estimates of the size of the GDP, but anywhere from 4 to 10% of our GDP comes from mining. Mining jobs are skilled and extremely well paid. They are the highest paid in the country. For a metallurgical engineer, geologist, you're looking at six figures average. We are the largest employer of private se of First Nations. And, um, and what is also particularly interesting about mining is it is one of the, if not the only, truly national industry in this country. In other words, pretty well almost every province and territory has mining. And our biggest cities, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, are all global hubs for either technical, technical services companies or mining companies or finance, as already mentioned. So, as, I'm sa as I have said, there are very few industries, if any other in Canada, that can make all of the claims that I'm making here. So, I argue that if we want to be internationally competitive in something, let's focus on what we have, what we're good at, and leverage that. And on top of it, the time, there's no better time than now. Um, we are seeing, of course, that, um, and many people believe that there's a, quote, historic opportunity right now for Canada to take global leadership in the resource sector, given the scarcity of resources and, of course, the increasing demand that we're seeing from very fast-growing co countries like China. And there is a perceptible change in attitude towards resource development in our country right now. There is this recognition um, that perhaps being a hewer of wood and drawer water is not such a bad thing because the world wants and needs what we have. So I think there's a, a, uh, there's an, a unique opportunity right now to leverage the competitive advantages that we have. But as Charles Dickens would say, it's the best of times and it's also the worst of times for the sector. And I'm just going to go through a, key point, a few key points of what some of those challenges that we're facing right now. Number one is the geology. The industry has undergone a massive change in the sense of, in the past, mines were underground, they were small, and they were high grade. We've run out of basically the easy, good resource. And now we are being forced to look further and further afield, go to more and more remote locations, under the ice, to the top of the mountains, um, grades are low and the, and the mines have gotten larger and larger. So we have poor resource value, huge mines, big open pit. Very different, very different. That also means the costs have gone up tremendously. And the ability to process that ore has also become much more complex. At the same time, the industry right now is very financially fragile. This is the fallout of the, of the super cycle that we've seen in the commodity sector. And many companies, most companies, through financial discipline, right out the window. So they built up a lot of massive mines all around the world. And when commodity prices went through the floor, all of these companies were left with heavy debt, high costs, and unprofitable mines. And of course, this is all aggravated by the fact that the mining sector is not pro is, has very low productivity. Then you have, of course, the challenges of the environment. The larger mines and the larger technology that comes with those mines means that you have a larger carbon footprint, more water usage, more energy uses. So there's a challenge there at a time when, of course, the world is demanding that we, we reduce the carbon footprint and our energy and our water use. And of course, there's increasing um, pressure from NGOs and from local communities to mine responsibly and share the benefits of, what, of the sector with, in country as well. And in addition to that, of course, there's rising uh, resource nationalism. And then, of course, there's 
the global competition of countries like China who want to get in on this sector. So really, if we are going to face these myriad challenges, I think most people would agree that if we're going to actually grab hold of this opportunity, that opportunity lies with being more innovative. If we're, we're going to have to embrace innovation in a variety of different ways if we are going to maintain our global leadership. The problem is, is that there are few industries, I would argue, few industries that are less innovative than mining. And I'm sorry to have to say that publicly, but it's true. Um, this is an industry that's extremely conservative. As, um, as uh, one uh, senior executive mentioned to me, it's the last bastion of a lot of things. <laughs> and I will not be <laughs> naming names. Um, but um, as the CEO of Anglo-American has said, the, in the mining industry, we're some, we're some 20 to 30 years behind other more progressive sectors in terms of productivity and business practice. Um, Rob McEwen, who I'm sure many of you have known from uh, Gold Corp, and he now heads up McEwen Mining, uh, describes the, the sector as being dominated by inertia and linear thinking. And if you think about the major technology that goes into mining, ball mills, flotation cells, don't ask me to explain what they do, but most of this, most of this technology is 150 years old. And much of it, because of the size, only 2 to 3% of it is actually used for grinding the rock. The rest is actually used, you know, is, is, is the energy just to keep these machines running. So there's some major challenges here in terms of, uh, of being able to overcome this, this inertia in, in mining. So the question then becomes, and, and it's just, you know, basically there's, there's, there's an unwillingness to adopt new technology. Um, so the challenge for Canada um, is, how do I say this, is <laughs> it's, an, it's a conservative industry globally, and uh, many people that I talk to in the sector would concede that the Canadian industry is even more conservative than the global industry as a whole. I know everybody's shocked to hear that. Um, but it's, you know, it's that whole, it's not, a, it's not a mining thing, it's a Canadian thing. It's that whole, you know, uh, I'd rather copy and put me second in line. So, you know, that has been brought to the industry uh, as well. A race to second, as some have, have, have described it. So the danger is, of course, is that we fall further and further behind um, and we lose that global leadership specifically to the Australians, who of course do everything better than we do. Um, so, see, some of the challenges that we face, and I'll just list off some of them. We have no super majors, so even though we have a, a very large cluster, we have no super majors. Those are, of course, the Anglo-Americans, the BHP Pilotins, the Glencore Strata, and the Rio Tinto and the Valles. So we don't have the big, big, big companies who are often the source of innovation financing and around which ecosystems, of course, develop. Um, we lost our two historic mining companies, Inco and Falcon Ridge, and of course, Noranda was part of that. And um, there are still people who shed tears today. Um, and of course, with that went a lot of the in-house R&D that those big companies used to perform. Um, we've lost a lot of our copper smelting capacity. We've lost, I think it's four of, the, of seven that we have in the country have now gone to the custom, you know, custom mini, uh, mills in, in China now. Um, and in fact, we, we do invest very little in R&D in the mining sector. 0.5% of, our, of, of global of, of mining revenue is dedicated to R&D, more or less, that Australia spends about three times that. And compared to industries in, in, in general, my understanding is between 5 and 30% of revenue from some companies are spent in R&D compared to 0.5 in the mining industry. On top of that, I know everybody will be surprised to hear this, very fragmented in terms of uh, linkages between industry, academia, government. I know no one's ever heard of that happening in Canada before, but it happens in mining. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so, so very, there's a lot of disconnects, very fragmented. That, 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 um, that power that we have in the industry is, is, is not well leveraged. Um, and mining itself is, is, has become out of vogue in, in many universities as well. It's called material science now. Um, and there's a missing generation of skilled workers in this sector. The 80s and the 90s was the death valley for mining. 
due to secular trends in commodity prices, but also here in Canada specifically. British Columbia actively rejected mining development just because they thought it was bad. So you had all these people with no jobs and now you have a gap of 20 years where there's basically no experts in the field any longer. Um, and of course this is now all exacerbated by the competition with the oil sands for those very, score, very scarce skilled resources. And last but not least, we have um, a damaging perception problem, or a lack of perception. And that is basically the fact that most Canadians don't know how important mining is to our economy. They just don't know. When my first job out of university, I went to go work for the daily, the Flin Flon Daily Reminder. It was during the recession, I have a lot of choices. And, um, I'm, I'm from Montreal originally, and I was driving up the, that lonely road up north, northern Manitoba town, and there was this giant smokestack. I said, what the heck is that? I had no idea it was a mining town. And I spent my year there, and I learned that's where my, my love of mining came from. Um, but that's where I began to really appreciate, in fact, what mining meant to this country and how it, in fact, was the foundation of a lot of prosperity that we, we now enjoy today. So there is a real disconnect between where our prosperity comes from, and people actually appreciate, appreciating it and knowing about it. As um, one gentleman I spoke to said, he said, we treat mining like a utility. It's just there, nobody thinks about it. Only when someone shuts the light, lights out will people freak out. Um, so I just want to, and, and this is basically in, in Mark, I've mentioned Australia a few times, this is in Mark contrast to Australia, of course, and many people in Canada and the industry now believe that, that Australia definitely has surpassed us. They have the super majors like BHP, Pilotin, and Rio Tinto. They invest three times more in research and development the, than, than we do, and they're fabulous collaborators, fabulous co collaborator, co collaborators, and they're risk takers. And they've, they've put together amazing vehicles where they bring mining companies together in consortia, and they invest huge amounts of money in new technologies and innovation. And that, in fact, is where our mining companies are going to make the investments. They're doing it there. Nothing like what they do exists here in Canada. And, uh, and, and that's not only on the consortium side, but how government works with industry and academia. Um, to, to really leverage all those, those capacities. So, in summing up, and when I'm talking about how we want to take advantage, I'll just go through a, a few, briefly, a few key areas where I think we can, we can um, make a big difference. And I guess the very first thing I would say is that we actually have to make a choice. We need to make the decision and embrace the fact that we're going to choose this sector as a sector to be a global leadership. It, to, to have global leadership, that we're going to say we are miners, we are, we are the world's best miners, and we are going to embrace it from all aspects. So it's about being smart, it's about being strategic, and treating this industry, pardon the pun, like the gold mine it is, because it is a gold mine. So that means thinking about all the different areas of, the stra of this strategy. Um, I'm not going to, I have in here kind of what companies need to do because I do believe that companies themselves have the first responsibility to change this. Um, but since this is more of a policy crowd, I'll, I'll just move on a little bit and uh, mention a few things. Um, we have something in Canada called the Canadian Mining Innovation Council. They've done some good work. They've, you know, been, they've been kind of a, working around the edges now since 2007. They've finally managed to bring together a pretty good consortia of about uh, 53 organizations looking at a particular kind of technology, but we need more of that. The head of this organization spends his time begging for money um, when really he should be, be really thinking of what kind of technologies and what kind of consortia he could, he could put together. Um, I think Ailish mentioned the uh, Strategic Aerospace Defense Initiative. Um, if we can do that for aerospace, we should be doing that for this sector. Um, I think that universities need to take it up a notch in terms of how they connect with the sector. Um, in, with the, the mining guys that I talk to, they don't, they don't have, um, how would I put it? Um, they really believe that universities could be doing a lot more to work with them. Um, one executive I spoke to described the way they work as they're about uh, a mile deep and an inch wide. They're not really covering the gamut of, of, of programs that these sectors, that this sector needs. Uh, mile deep. 
mile deep and an inch wide. Yeah. And um, two more things that I'll say quickly because I've been told to end now. Um, <laughs> one is co corporate social responsibility is a, cre a key competitive advantage for Canada. He, we are the best in the world at this. We are simply nicer than everyone else, including the Australians. And we need to find a way to make that work for us. So that means working together and picking these companies up rather than trying to pull them down. So uh, initiatives like C300, that's the opposite of what we want to be doing. We don't want to be looking for ways to black mark companies. We want to be, working, we want to be finding best practices and selling that to the world finding ways to share that and improve on that, but working with our companies, not the opposite. And the last thing I would say is we need, a, a, I think, a branding exercise. There's been some initial effort on, in this, in this uh, area with the Chamber of Commerce. They have this new Partnership for Resource Trade, great initiative, but we've got to work on this more and actually be able to instill in this country a sense of pride about mining that will draw in the young people to want to work in this sector. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm delighted to have been invited to comment on papers by these two outstanding thought leaders in their respective fields. Um, I, I've worked uh, with Andrea and with Jennifer both, and so it's a real privilege. They're exceptional uh, professionals. And both have written papers of real substance with a sense of urgency about the need to do things differently, about the role that Canada can play globally, and the challenges uh, that we must meet to do so. Both papers address pivotal issues for Canada, the need to embrace innovation if we are to continue to prosper in a world that just is increasingly uh, competitive and intense about it, and the potential for Canada to become a world leader in exporting the lessons of city building. In a world that I would say that where cities get it right, have to get it right, if we want the world to get it right. And both are specific. They translate abstract comments, like innovation, like city building, into pragmatic, specific remedies that educate and motivate action. I've had the privilege of reading both papers, so Andrea goes into more detail than you had time to do here. Um, the topics are obviously different, and tying them together in seven minutes, I guess, is a trick. But uh, innovation in the mining industry and how Canada can play a leadership role there with city building. But they are linked by the innovation challenge, which brings to mind the cartoon where one character says to the other, of course, I'm totally in favor of progress, it's just change I don't like. So I'm going to start with Jennifer's paper first. She starts by observing that cities represent progress, our hope for humanity, really. Interesting that Lewis Mumford, who got it wrong on Jane Jacobs, actually did see cities as the hope uh, for humanization, for, for humanity. But it's so very different from how cities were perceived in centuries past as places that were dirty, foul-smelling, smell unhealthy, dangerous, and poor. Today, they're the engines of national growth, the principal sites of innovation, and the production of knowledge-intensive goods and services. They're the venue for social inclusion, where we address the impl implications of a massive influx of people, and people who are from increasingly diverse backgrounds. And as the source of 80% of carbon emissions from human activities, I've always been struck by this fact, we, geographically cities take up 2% of the land mass, but of the world, but they account for 80% of emissions uh, human, from humans. Uh, they're critical to the struggle for environmental sustainability. But as Jen points out, so many of the world's cities face challenges that are just daunting. We're blessed, we're blessed, because our cities are consistently rated at or near the top of international rankings as the, of the world's top cities. So can we innovate? Can we make the changes to address the problems that our cities have and thereby play a global leadership role. I have to admit, I found Jennifer's paper inspiring about the potential of cities to really do this. But the truth is, I've spent most of my life, most of my professional life, looking at the challenges, looking at the problems. Now, because I'm short, I really always try to see the glass half full. 
But I have to admit that my disappointment at how we continuously squander opportunities when it comes to cities, how we fail to make the investments that we should, has outweighed my optimism. Most notably, our neglect of physical infrastructure, this is top of mind for me, roads, bridges, sewers, waste management, and because I just did the transit panel for the Premier, transit, which is our biggest issue certainly in the GTA. The failure to integrate land use and transportation planning, well, that's what Jennifer spends her life doing. Cities are expanding way, way faster than the, pop than the numbers of our population are growing. If we keep going in this direction, it's just going to be one be huge sprawl. The growing income inequality that we have in our cities. Yes, it's worse in the US where I am now, but we are growing faster. The outdated 19th century financial architecture which really grew out of a rural experience. And finally, governance structures that don't work well for metropolitan regions. Now, Jennifer has suggested solutions, and they involve our federal government. And I am in total agreement, and have been for decades. In my current role at the Wilson Center, I am studying governance for regional transit systems. And I have been struck by the prominent and critical role, the constructive role, that the US federal government plays in that regard. The same was true when I studied homelessness in the 1990s. And I was really impressed then with how HUD in the United States was so important, not just for providing revenue to help with the problem, but incenting collaboration via its funding formulas. I remember visiting New York and the way they got together. New York's a very complicated city with tons of agencies. How did they get together? Because HUD said, we're only funding one request. It took them about a minute to figure out that they had to work together. A national urban agenda could powerfully affect the ability of our cities to achieve a prosperity that is sustainable and to contribute by example and support to progress worldwide. But there's also much that we can do at the provincial, regional, and local levels. And time does not permit me to elaborate, but perhaps in discussion, and so maybe I'll conclude my part on Jennifer's paper with a question. What impediments are there at the local and regional level in other words, when I think of the local, the urban-suburban divide in Toronto, to what extent, and the value split, force amalgamation, which now puts Toronto as one-third of the total region, uh, how does, can that be overcome? And this brings me to Andrea's paper, because it's about the willingness to innovate. There's a cute cartoon in the New Yorker this week, and it shows a butterfly admonishing, um, admonishing a, a caterpillar, but you have to really want to change. <laughs> And I, I, and I think that this takes us to what Andrea, in her, in her book, which I read, and if you haven't read it, it was great, Why Mexicans Don't Drink Molson. That was a wake-up call, that Canadian business leaders have been too complacent, and we have to wake up to the reality of global competitiveness. And now she's done a deep dive in this paper into mining. And our productivity, our poor productivity growth in Canada is not a new problem. It's been going on since the uh, mid-'80s, despite the U.S. free trade, despite NAFTA. And it's why, this is widely understood. Everybody knows we're, we have a high wage economy. The way we're going to compete in a global world is innovation. So that really the $64,000 question is if everybody agrees, why aren't we doing something about it? And if I could take the rest of the day and a half, Roland, I could go into that. <laughs> but the fact is we aren't. If you go on the conference board website, they've just come out with a new report showing that we continue to underperform. Canada is in 13th place on innovation, a whole multitude of indicators, when it comes to innovation. We are in the doldrums. We got a D. You know, really. Um, Andrew's paper in the mining sector gives us some really deep insight into why. Are we, too, we are too conservative. As she said, we, I, I would put it differently. We don't seek to own the podium, we go for the bronze. We seem to lack the entrepreneurial spirit to take the risks the chutzpah, as it were. When I was at the conference board, we launched a big project on what businesses could do to be more innovative. And we were of the mind then that government had really done its share and it was up to business to step up to the plate. Andrea tells us that this is not true of the mining sector, although it is true in general uh, of industry. Um, and uh, when you look at R&D investment, that would be an indicator uh, in terms of what business is not doing. So the question is, why do business leaders shy away from innovation? Is it because they don't really believe that the platform is burning? We were protected by um, a low dollar for a long time. That helped to shelter us from uh, reality. Is it because it's so expensive and so much harder to extricate 
and process the ore? Is it because of those? It's, it's, it's because of those who are in charge. In her paper, she did not mention this, but it but it certainly caught my attention. She says those who are in charge are gray-haired men, and I'm sure she just meant mature. <laughs> Is it something in our DNA or culture? You can change. You can edit that. You have time to edit that before. <laughs> Is it something in our D DNA or culture? Are we the image captured in the old joke? Why do Canadians cross the road to get to the middle? <laughs> The problem is if you stay, no, the problem is what she's telling us, if you stay in the middle, you tend to get run over. <laughs> the book Startup Nation, the story of Israel's miracle a couple years ago, offers startling comparisons to Canada when it comes to innovation. Israel leads the world in the percent of GDP that goes to R&D, research and development, which is the driver of innovation. It has the highest number of startups per capita in the world. It, the book offers several reasons, but in the end, it argues it's culture. So I will conclude with a few questions for Andrea. You've outlined the huge strengths of the mining sector. I was blown away by the stat that it's up to 10% of our GDP. And you've outlined the challenges. Given its importance to our economy, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic about the industri industry's future? You didn't, you didn't say that. What specifically can or should government do? And you mentioned a whole bunch of things. I am one of those who still is crying over the loss of Inco, Inco and Falcon Bridge. I have to tell you, you'd be giving a different speech if we had that today, I believe. How did that happen? What could the government, should the government have done, and I think it was the government, to step in to somehow change that scenario? How much of the problem is image, both as a dirty industry and as a utility that we take for granted? So I would say, what are the three most important things we should be doing? Giving money to that innovation council that you mentioned? Creating industry teams like they did in Australia? Having a giant branding exercise? At the conference board, we did do one, by the way, for the mining sector, how to attract women to the job. And I was told by the sector that it, it helped, because it's not a sector that immediately attracts, whereas women have flooded into all the professions. Uh, I think um, mining does have an image that doesn't seem to um, attract, uh, attract women as much. At my time, oh, I have one minute, and I'll use that minute to thank both of our outstanding presenters for the effort that they have put into writing this paper. I happen to know, I've been working closely with Jen, and uh, her schedule is daunting, hugely busy, and I said to her privately, to put this amount of time and effort uh, into what I think is a very, very stimulating, thoughtful paper, brilliant. And Andrea, you have a full-time job a personal life, I think, and and um, and I, <laughs> do, do we think <laughs> maybe? <laughs> and and I and I think Roland, it's respect for this conference uh, that you have uh, been handed two marvelous papers that I think really make an important contribution to the discussion. Thanks very much for inviting me to be part of this. Okay, is this on? Right. One, two, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, thank you very, very much for the papers and for the excellent commentary. My job's done. Uh, we're going to go to uh, questions from the floor in approximately two minutes, but maybe you want to take a run at answering Anne's uh, questions. Jennifer, a question and sure. Andrea series. And can I throw another one for each of you? Uh, Jennifer, uh, the last federal experimentation with a department of cities was under the Martin government and uh, seeing Minister Godfrey wrestle with, uh, you know, it was big cities, don't forget medium cities, don't forget villages, don't forget hamlets. And my question is, uh, these are very difficult things for politicians to choose. Uh, what about the role of the FCM? What about the role of groups like Jeff Cape and uh, 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 Evergreen and the project that they're undertaking with uh, CityWorks. Can this be run from outside? I guess is one question I have for you. And Andrea, uh, <clears throat> other sectors, uh, I think of the chemical industry, I think of forestry, I think of the oil and gas sector to a certain degree. The specter of regulation, uh, you know, is an, you know, really does stiffen the spine. Is that one of the areas that, you know, we could look at in terms of, you know, kicking the industry into the 21st century and away from using 150-year-old technology? So maybe we could start. 
Sure, thank you very much. Is this on? It is on, okay, good. Um, I think I'll begin with your question and then I'll go to uh, I'll go to Anne's. I'm very glad you asked your question because you'll notice that I didn't recommend a Department of Cities. I recommended something called an urban agenda, which is much more nuanced and subtle. And it is in fact about a way of thinking about everything that we do. And it's about recognizing the role that cities play in a whole variety of different policies policy frameworks that we implement at the federal and of course at the provincial level. And a couple of comments on that approach, which I think was a valent approach to try and address at the national level some kind of consideration for cities. I don't think we need a Department of Cities at the federal level. What I think we need is absolute clarity as to the national interest in cities. We need to state that, and we need to link together federal policy in a whole variety of different disciplines to the thriving as our, of our cities as the way that we manifest that national interest. So it's not about having a new silo around cities. It's actually about a campaign. And this is what I meant by calling it something that's pervasive. It's about a campaign. It's about an understanding. It's about a culture around the way we approach our country. Now, the second piece, which is a really critical piece, this what really happened uh, in the earlier exercise was that it got crushed under the weight of inclusivity. That we, oh, we can't do something for cities that we don't do for little communities. Well, I can tell you, the city of Toronto, 2.7 million people and growing rapidly, is very different from Vancouver. And yet Vancouver and Toronto get lumped in the same category. But Vancouver is a city of 700,000. It's growing at about a quarter of the pace that Toronto is growing at. So you cannot have a policy framework that's the same for Vancouver as is for Toronto. You need a differentiated approach, let alone what happened in the earlier exercise, which was clumping together cities like Toronto at 2.7 million with little hamlets of 400 or five, five, 400 people or 5,000 people. You simply cannot, you, the, the, the national interest in that kind of a community, it's, it's not there. And, and it's, it was disingenuous, I think, and it, of course, was very political, but it's, it, it, we do not do ourselves uh, a favor when we, and I think it's an example of standing in the middle of the road and getting hit by a car, that we weren't willing to make the bold statement that our cities, Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, our large cities, in fact, play a very special role in driving our economy in this city, in driving immigration and the success of our immigration. And as a result, there needs to be a way that we think about and fund a whole variety of infrastructure initiatives across a whole variety of different platforms in order to respect that interest. And that's why the notion of an urban agenda as opposed to a department or a division is, is very important. It's about a campaign of ideas. And the starting point is stating that national interest. We need to state it at the federal level. This country has a very clear interest in having cities that thrive. It links into a whole variety of other fundamental values that we have as, as a country. So that's my, you know, kind of my response on the, on the historic uh, piece. With respect to um, what the Im impediments are, Anne's question, what are the impediments to this being implemented at the national, at, at, the, at the local level, these tensions at the local level? I believe the answer is the same, is that we haven't yet figured out, and we haven't stated at the national level, that if we care about climate change, that there are ways that we govern at the local level that are, the, are in the interest of the entire country, and I would extrapolate, they're at the interest of the entire world. And I think we need to make those connections and set a framework based on an understanding of this national interest in getting our cities right. I'll give you a perfect example. I uh, very quickly referenced, because I was running out of time, which is why I was flipping over my words, but I very quickly referenced the work by Professor uh, David Gordon at Queen's University, because we like to say, oh, we've become an urban nation. And David Gordon raised the question, well, really, how urban are we? And he, in fact, looked at what we call our urban areas, and we use that language to distinguish rural from urban. And he said, well, let's look at a finer grain in our cities 
uh, where people live. And he identified a variety of different categories. Auto-oriented suburbs, transit-oriented suburbs, ex-urban and active cores. Now, from a sustainability perspective, we like to talk about the, we, we know that the most sustainable places in the world are in fact cities where you can live with a, a much lower environmental, environmental footprint. But when we lump together the suburban and the urban, we actually lose that nuance because we know many of those suburban places are the biggest risk to our country because they have very high infrastructure costs on a per capita basis. It's very simple. Low density communities, it costs a lot of money to get water, to get the streets plowed. Those sidewalks that no one ever walks on in our suburban communities, they cost a lot of money to, to, to build and subsequently to maintain. And when we talk about the infrastructure deficit, there's this real risk that we're investing in this infrastructure that really doesn't have any, of, it has very little benefit in terms of a return, and yet it presents this great risk. So this research is so critical because it began to separate and to recognize that within our cities, there's places that we are designing that are contributing to innovation, that are mitigating climate change, that are reducing unemployment, that are facilitating the, the integration of immigrants, that are contributing to prosperity. And on the flip side, there's places or suburban communities that in fact do all of the opposite. They in fact, they in fact are a drain on resources. They don't play a role with respect to, in, to innovation. They're very highly resource consumptive. And it's very interesting to look at the Canada versus the America uh, in this analysis because one of the big differences between our Canadian cities and American ones is that we don't sprawl to the same extent. And if you look at the global meltdown, well, it was a real estate meltdown. It was an urban planning meltdown as an outcome of a very costly and consumptive form of land development that was highly subsidized by the government that in the end couldn't be sustained. The government couldn't continue paying for those roads. We in fact didn't go there in part because we've planned our cities differently. But to get back to um, Professor Gordon's work, the risk is there's vast areas of our country that are at the exact same risk of those areas in American, in American communities. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Tim, to answer your question about if what we need is more regulation, <sighs> perish the thought. Um, no, I, I, I mean, at a very high level, that's not to say that, you know, in specific areas there may be a need for this, but in a general kind of overarching um, kind of statement, I would say that the, the problem here isn't the need for more regulation. Um, I, would, I, I would say that there's already plenty out there. Um, and I would also add that, you know, as I mentioned, companies are financially challenged at the moment. They're already, uh, the margins are very thin, the costs are already extremely high. Many of them are hobbled by debt. Um, so uh, to add that extra layer, I think, would be to, tr to be further handcuffing a, an industry that I would think our goal would be to support and strengthen uh, as much as possible. Uh, on the other side, I think that it's more of a, of a carrot kind of approach that we should be taking. Uh, this industry, and, and I don't know how much it's like others, but they're very focused on their individual operations. They don't tend to work as a group. Um, and so because they work so individually and in silos, um, there's, there's a missed opportunity, as I've, as I've said, to kind of leverage their combined power to invest in the kind of, uh, of innovations that would reduce carbon footprint, that would reduce um, energy use, for example. And, and I would add that um, you know, a, lot the, 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 a lot of the technology in that area has often come with government support. If you look at carbon capture, for example, and what people in the industry tell me is any truly transformative um, tech, uh, innovation that has come through in mining has come, come through with, with, with the help of government 
um, uh, research because government research can be much more broad based versus an industry, a company is looking at the specific problem of that specific operation. Um, so there is a real opportunity there, um, I think. And, um, and I give you an example, um, in Australia, they have um, there's a there's a great consortium called Amira, and they it's basically a consortium of, of of mineral companies and suppliers, and they come together, and they 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 you know they 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 leverage their their uh, their resources on collaborative research projects, and this has led to all kinds of spin-offs. One of which is um, something called the DETCRC, and they work together with the Australian government. And it's a deep extraction cooperative research center, which is leveraging $145 million in government industry funding to develop real-time borehole data. Um, one of the biggest investors in that is Barrick. Um, so we don't have anything close to that in Canada. And in fact, um, in 10 years' time, in the last 10 years, um, all told, government has invested $20 million in the Canadian mining industry. Just to give you an example, versus I think aerospace, it's in the magnitude of over a billion. So just to give you a, a comparative example. And I forget what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question was where would we start? Maybe we could. I think we're going to go to the floor, mm -hmm. okay. if we may, and then we can weave in that answer. So I, there's a couple of questions. There's one in the back. Uh, where's the microphone? Somebody, oh, Bob Fowler. Sorry, hi, and Bob Fowler, the gra here. Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Um, Andrea, thank you for your defense of the importance of mining to Canadians. I think it was right on and terrific, and I'm reminded of both your story about the rush to second and Anne's the rush to the middle of the Canadian athlete, athlete who returned from Sochi with his gold medal and was so proud of it that he had it bronzed. Um, uh, so so uh, you came in, in response to, to the, the first question you got, you came very close to the answer the, to the question I wanted to ask you, which is um, I agree it's not about C300, it's not about new regulation. It's not about ways to punish people's behavior abroad. It's about leadership. And uh, surely, I, I agree that the industry is not the most innovative. It is the most important. It is producing jobs all over the world where development does not produce jobs. Development does wonderful stuff, but it doesn't produce jobs and economic activity and revenues that allow countries to operate. Mm -hmm. But surely, if Canada is a leader in this industry, Canada ought to be a leader in managing the industry and in managing the industry abroad. Canada ought to be a fully compliant member of the EITI. Um, uh, the government ought to be setting standards for Canadians and the industry as a whole to follow. Uh, do you not think that the government can be more effective and more assertive and more articulate and more innovative in terms of that kind of leadership? <sighs> While you're answering, um, there's a few other questions up front that we can move the mics to. So go ahead, answer those. Um, I'm I'm a little reluctant, um, only because I've I've worked in government um, on the political side, so I'm, I apologize for that. But um, that it, it I will say it does make me uh, a little nervous. There's there's. Um, I think there's been some really great initiatives um, in terms of what the government has been doing. I think the idea of, um, for example, um, the Canadian International Institute for Extractive, Extractive Industries, these kinds of initiatives where we are establishing best practices, um, I think that's a great way to start. I am, I will say, a little bit reluctant with what you're suggesting, only because I, I, I will question you know, um, we don't, I'm wondering, I guess the, it's more of a, a question I'd put out there is why don't we have similar things for, or maybe we do and I don't know, um, uh, for the textile sector or um, um, for giant uh, data um, uh, factories that, you know, rip up more forests than I care to think of. So I just feel like there's a bit of a, 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 a that this sector is 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 uh, targeted more than others unduly, and I, I just I'm I'm putting that out there as just a thought, um, 
And I just feel that there's other ways to go about this without causing um, unintentional consequences. Okay, uh, Stephen, and then there's one in the back. Good. Hi, I'm Steve Sademan, uh, NIPSIA, as well as uh, CIC bl uh, blogger. Uh, I'm going to ask the same question I was going to ask earlier, but repackage it to make it relevant for this panel, too. <laughs> and it's a, more of a comment than a question, and it's incredibly self serving. Um, <laughs> But it's striking that in the conversations both by the women in front of me and the, the women on the panel, that we completely ignore the role of universities and, and a trend that's going on in Canada that's actually cutting against any effort to innovate in the world, which is uh, the Canadian government, uh, uh, Canadian governments across Canada are gutting higher education. So uh, one of the previous speakers talked about Canada investing in t teaching in Asia. And my first response is, we, we, we are being gutted at home, so let's do more abroad. Uh, that seems to be a conflict to me. And when we talk about the, this role of cities in Canada, one of the strategic advantages Canada has is, is you have lots of really fine universities located in Canadian cities. And we need to do something to reimagine the reality, or at least repackage the reality that universities are actually f big, better m multipliers than almost any other part of what governments can spend money on. And since they happen to be in Canadian cities, McGill, UDM, UCAM, Concordia, Carleton to be even more self-serving, uh, University of Ottawa, Toronto, UBC, most of these schools are in cities. And so it seems to me that that one of the first things we need to do is stop the current trend, which is in, in Ontario in a way, the current election has the major parties competing how best to cut higher education, which seems to be in the wrong direction if we want to actually innovate and compete in the world and do stuff at home. Okay, before you answer that, I'm going to take two other quick questions. One from Brett in the back has been waiting, and Paul? Sorry, I have to choose. Sorry. Go ahead. Hi, thanks very much. Brett House from the Sauvé Foundation and CG in Waterloo. Uh, innovation and competitiveness both require capital, and yet since the cnoc nexon discussion, our policy, or lack thereof, on foreign investment has been in tatters. Uh, there was some lamenting of the passage of some of our big names in the mining industry, uh, and also a call for you know, greater maturity, Canada being a big boy in a variety of different ways. What do you think our policy on foreign investment should be, either for simulating competitiveness at the municipal level uh, or for our major extractive industries? Because right now, we have none. It is a massive vacuum on the policy front. Thank you. Paul? Uh, Paul Heinbecker from uh, CG and from uh, Laurier University also. I'm just very grateful that the two of you were put on the same panel because after I listened to the presentation on mining, um, I thought to myself that pretty much this is the end of the day. Uh, you know, I'm perhaps I date myself when I talk about uh, this. The, you know, that you, you reminded me, or the presentation reminded me of Pogo, uh, where he says, "We have met the enemy, and he is us." I, we don't. Uh, the, the, the lack of productivity, uh, lack of adventure, lack of uh, of, of foresight. Uh, I was really quite in the doldrums until I heard the, the, the city presentation where actually we're beating the world. So can somebody reconcile those two things for me? <laughs> okay, it. we're, we're going to have to do this really quickly. All right. I'll, I'll be very succinct. I can do okay. that. I awesome. can do that. Okay. Yes, no. um, on the university front, um, what I would just tell you is I'm just going to feed you back the, the, the industry reaction to, in, uh, to university. Um, to, it, it's not very positive. And, and, and there's just a feeling that universities are not meeting the needs of this industry. Um, the, the biggest problem seems to be that um, university professors are not, are really driven by their own research projects. And, there's, and that's what it's all about. And, and it, it, they're, not, they're not really responsive to what the industry needs. But, don't kill the messenger. Um, on, on, uh, on, on the whole Investment Canada Act, and I think this might be where s some people here disagree with me, um, I, I personally am the belief, um, having worked in politics, that, um, that the ambiguity there is not a bad thing. Um, I, I, it gives us margin, it gives us, it gives us the wiggle room to make decisions based on the actual case in front of us. If you, if you put very strict, um, very clear, strict uh, uh, rules 
then you're, you're caught out. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a believer in, in personally protecting companies. I think it's very sad what happened with Inco and Falcon Bridge. Do I think it should have been blocked? Probably not, sad as that is. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the lack of foresight, what I would say, and I didn't probably get a chance to really uh, uh, um, elaborate on it more, is the irony with, the indust with, with mining is, is that they are, this industry is one of the biggest risks, it is the biggest risk taking industry in Canada. You have guys dropping into the middle of the Congo, Papua New Guinea, um, they're going places no Canadians have, have ever, you know, have ever gone or dare to go. And this industry is, is it, the I irony is the junior sector does incredible things. Um, you know, we have a mine in the middle of Mauritania, uh, there's nothing there. Um, we have a mine in far eastern Russia. There's nothing there. Um, so there is a lot of, of risk taking in a certain way, if I can explain it like that. Um, but it's, it's that, that innovative step, the next step, I think, where we really, we falter a little bit. So th to the three questions, the first one, absolutely the relationship between our thriving cities and our very urban universities and the strength of those universities, they're inherently entwined. And as a city, we work very closely with the university and vice versa. And in the... Uh, uh, in order to keep this short, I will just reference Mars. For those who aren't familiar with Mars, Google Mars. But Mars is an incredible program uh, that is all about taking the innovation of the university and transferring that, that, that innovation into global products and global markets around the world. And it's all about incubation, collaboration, and proximity between a whole variety of interests. And it started based on medical research and has become much, much broader. And it's hailed as an international success. And there were some folks from New York uh, a couple months ago who were down looking at what we've done with Mars. So that relationship between strong universities and strong cities are entwined. And I would hope that that shared national interest statement would link those pieces together so that we can continue to strengthen our universities to strengthen our cities. With respect to the second question around uh, foreign investment, I think the, uh, again, having that national shared interest statement can help us understand the kinds of foreign investment that fit with larger strategic objectives that we have as a country. So that we're, we're linking those pieces together and leveraging them in such a way that we're attracting not all investments the same and we don't want every kind of foreign investment. Let's ensure that the foreign investment we're, we're attracting is responding to key objectives that we have building affordable housing, creating great um, transit infrastructure, which is an incredible amount of foreign interest in the transit projects that we have coming forward. And the third question uh, with respect to, I need to be reminded, what was the third one? Oh, right, the two of us here together. I was having the same thought uh, <laughs> about the two of us being on the panel together and trying to figure out how to piece those things together. Um, and at the uh, risk of offending my colleague, I'll say that I think part of the difference is we're, we're, when we talk about cities, we're talking about something that has a tremendous amount of momentum. And I believe our cities, metaphorically and practically, are rising in our national interest. They're rising as a national imperative. And I think mining, not being renewable, um, there's in fact going to, it's always going to be constrained. And when we look at our cities, our cities provide the impetus for knowledge-based, creative-based industries where the sky's the limit. And that's one way that I, I could never compare mining to Silicon Valley, because Silicon Valley is about innovation and knowledge-based development, which is fundamentally, ideologically different from resource, resource extraction. Okay, uh, I, I have to you, just be, you're I have to rebut. I mean, I just have to say that, I, yeah, I fundamentally disagree. And I would just say that it's mining that's gonna probably pay for most, most of the transit we hope to one day have in Toronto. Um, <laughs> yeah, because that's who makes the big bucks downtown. So if you, the guys who are paying the taxes, right, who are gonna be, that's the found a lot of the foundation of Toronto's prosperity comes from it being a financial global mining center and fra you know if you look at shale gas you as a perfect example of the continuation of a 
non-renewable. That's good to hear you articulate that the super majors are interested in paying higher rents to pay for our transit. That's good. And last comment. Thank you. I just want to make one last comment in response to how do we change a national mindset or how do we change the mindset of people across the nation. Um, I was trained as an historian. How do you, when do you have change? Change occurs, I spent 10 years learning this one point. <laughs> change occurs when the climate of opinion changes. How do you change the climate of opinion? Um, right now we're into a cutback mentality mostly because the middle class feels threatened and vulnerable and nobody has confidence in, 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 in government to spend wisely. Uh, it's a very end. We've had some traumatic events in the last decades, couple decades. I'm trying to think of events through history where you've seen mindset changes. Sometimes it happens over something cataclysmic, like in the US, the entire country, now that I'm living there, it's been unbelievable how paranoid it is since 9-11. I mean, you, you practically have to go through, uh, you know, to go to a CVS, you have to go through a body scan. I am overstating. But everything is like, you know, so uh, security oriented. On the issue of cities, I'm sensitive to it because I feel I spent my whole life trying to pass through the message, providing evidence that cities drive the economy disproportionately, that city regions are different than cities. So I'll just conclude with two quick notes. I was once with a major leader uh, of, a, of a province and explaining all of this, and it was a two hour fabulous discussion. And at the end of it says, absolutely, I agree, I agree, I agree. Just remember though, I cannot do for Toronto what we do not do for Wawa. And that was at the end of two hours. The second discussion I had was here in Ottawa, where the top bureaucrats at that time, head of Privy Council, top people uh, on the urban file, so to speak, were here. It was during the time when uh, John Godfrey's thing. And uh, I, we talked about the point that's, that's in, you know, in Ontario, or cities raise seven or eight percent of, of um, uh, sorry, cities raise the, the money, the bulk of the money is raised in cities, but only seven or eight cents of every dollar comes back to cities. And we were trying to explain, we hit it from every possible angle. And at the end of it, and there were people like former chief administrative officer from Toronto and, uh, and urban experts like Enid Slack and others, and we sat there and the, the question came back, but why should we give them our money? And although we tried to explain it wasn't their money, <laughs> I then realized in many ways that Ottawa is a city surrounded by the rest of Canada. And there is, I don't know how you, pan, I mean it's not an optimistic answer. That's why I asked both of you if you were optimistic or pessimistic. I don't know how you break through, but for sure, despite all of the evidence which is compelling, absolutely compelling and convincing, there is no acceptance of the role that cities, and it goes back to our brand of who we are, the hewers of, the hewers of water, the, the drawers of water, the hewers of wood, um, our, our imagery and our art. I love the group of seven, but we have gone beyond a bit. And, and uh, you know, all of the videos that show us of a land of mountains and trees and not so many people. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank both Jennifer and Andrea for excellent papers, really thought-provoking thought papers and interesting dialogue, and, and those excellent uh, uh, response on time. And I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank uh, Roland and uh, Taylor again for inviting me. And I would, I'd like to say that I think that the conference and doing more of this sort of thing is really important in terms of the policy community because my view is that the marketplace for new ideas is open. We're at a moment in the cycle where this sort of uh, conference and uh, this sort of thinking really matters. So thanks very much, everybody.